Hola. Notice my scenery hasn't changed much. I'm filming these all at once. Um, okay, so we have gone over the four, we're going over four biological molecules. Number one, tasty, delicious for energy storage and structural support. Those are the carbohydrates, otherwise called polysaccharides. Um, and then we have the nonpolar hydrophobic ones, which are the lipids. And now we're going to be talking about a very diverse group called the proteins. All right, so let me share my screen. Share. Come on. All right, let me get my pencils. Okay, um, come on. Good. All right, so proteins are a very diverse um, group of structures or biological molecules that have a huge number of functions. So these proteins are very oops, diverse in structure and function, right? That's my abbreviation for function, FXN. You'll probably see that a lot. So just like carbohydrates were made of monosaccharides and lipids were made of things like glycerol molecule and fatty acid, the proteins are made up of a monomer called amino acids, right? So an amino acid, oops, amino acid is the monomer for proteins. Amino acid is the monomer for proteins. Um, proteins are the most diverse biological molecule, both in structure and in function. Um, and the reason that they're for so damn diverse is that their monomers, these amino acids, come in 20 different flavors. It's almost like Baskin Robbins for biological molecules. Um, except not 31, but 20 is pretty damn good. Um, they are made of the following different atoms, right? And my previous students have called these chons. They're made of chons. Um, so carbon, hydrogen, oxygen, nitrogen, and sulfur. And we are going to focus a lot on um, the kind of protein that we're going to focus on a lot throughout the course are called enzymes. And my abbreviation for an enzyme is always this little Pac-Man guy. And these enzymes are going to be really important for speeding up the reactions within a cell, especially when we get to metabolism. So keep an eye out for that. So just an example of the different kinds of functions that a protein plays in a living organism. They can be structural, like hair, the keratin of a hair. They can be involved in cellular movement, right? So the muscles um, or the actin and myosin in our muscles um, are made of protein. They can be involved in defense, so the antibodies in our blood that help fight diseases. They can be involved in structure, um, so the albumin in an egg white, for example, providing support for an embryo. They can be involved in signaling, so different cells coming together to talk to one another. Um, and they can also be involved, like I said, in the function of enzymes to help kind of um, speed up reactions. And the example here is amylase, which is found in our saliva, that starts breaking down carbohydrates. Oops. Um, okay, so proteins are molecules composed of amino acids. And again, those are the monomers, whereas the proteins are the polymers for this biological molecule. So I told you they're very diverse because the monomers come in these 20 different flavors, right? 20 different kinds of amino acids. But to understand that, you have to understand what an amino acid looks like. So let's just talk about the name, amino acid, all right? So that should clue you into something based on our functional groups. First, they have, here indicated in yellow, they have an amino group. They have an amino group, that NH. They also have a carboxyl or a carboxylic acid group, right? So we have the carboxyl group. They have, so all amino acids have amino acid 
get it? Amino acid. But the crazy thing or the cool thing about these amino acids is that in the middle, they also have this R group. And the R group can be very variable. So they're very, it's very variable. Um, depending on which amino acid you are, you have a different R group. And that R group can, can, can contain many different functional groups. All right. So the R groups are what are gonna provide your protein or your amino acid with diverse properties, such for example as hydrophilic, depending on if they have some like, for, for example, hydro, um, hydroxyl groups, or hydrophobic if they have groups such as a methyl group. So amino acids come together through dehydration synthesis, just like all the other monomers, but they create a special kind of covalent bond, right? So here at the top in this diagram, we have one amino acid here. This is, I'm gonna call it amino acid one. And then we have here, we have our amino acid two. They're gonna to come together to release water through a dehydration synthesis, but the kind of bond that is formed is called a peptide bond. Right? And that would go on your worksheet and your little biological molecules worksheet. It's called, a, it's called a peptide bond. It is covalent. And if you'll notice, it is going to form between a C from the carboxyl group and an N from the adjacent amino acid amino group. Right? So the peptide bond is between the C and the N, one from the amino group and one from the carboxyl group. Simple dehydration reaction, but the bond is called something a little special. Just like glycosidic bond for carbohydrates, now we have a peptide bond for protein. So when you have many, many amino acids joined together, you get what is called a polypeptide, which is basically a chain of amino acids. The proteins vary in length, number of amino acids, and in sequence, meaning which of those 20 amino acids do you have in an order, all right? And the protein function absolutely dictates the shape of the protein and therefore, um, so let me write that down really quick. So, um, what was I gonna say? Oh yeah, so structure will dictate the function, all right? So, the sequence of amino acids is going to determine the shape of it, meaning the structure, and that will determine the function of the protein. If you have proteins that lose their shape for whatever reason, you get what is called a, it, you lose the function. So here we have a folded protein, a chain of amino acids that have been brought together through dehydration synthesis and peptide bonds to form a big, long chain that then folds into these interesting shapes. When you have a protein that's been called denatured, you go down to kind of just the chain of amino acids and you get an unfolded protein. And that will be no function. So here we have no function. All right. So here are an example of, we have one, two, three, four, five different types of amino acids. Remember, there's 20 of them. Your book has a really nice sheet of them. Um, I'm not gonna make you memorize them. Some teachers do, I'm not going to. What I am gonna ask you to do is that you have to understand what the function or the properties rather of the functional group would be. So again, every amino acid has an amino group and a carboxyl group, right? And then in blue here, this is called the R group. And the R group has a variety of different functional groups on it. So the first thing, looking, um, looking at number one, two, three, four, five, which one of these are hydrophobic versus hydrophilic, right? So again, look at the functional groups. Oh, look, we have a carboxyl group here. Is that polar or nonpolar? That's going to be polar. What about here? Oh, sorry. We have another carboxyl group. So that would be polar as well. So these two are going to be polar, meaning that they are going to be hydrophilic or water loving. And down here we have 
remember when you have a ring like this, we, those are composed of a bunch of carbons bound to each other. So is that gonna be polar or nonpolar? Remember, carbon-carbon bonds are nonpolar. Here, what is that functional group? That's a methyl that is gonna be nonpolar. So these two are nonpolar. This one is a very special amino acid. And you don't have to know the names of a lot of amino acids. This one you have to know. It's called cysteine, right? And cysteine can do something really cool. And so here, let's see if I can move my face out of the way. So, um, so cysteine can form what is called a disulfide bond with another cysteine. So for example, if you had an amino acid with a, another cysteine right there, these two S's could form a covalent bond together, and that is called a disulfide bond right um so that's kind of special <laughs> that's one of the unique ones all right so again peptide bonds hold all the amino acids together they result from a dehydration synthesis between amino and carboxyl groups every amino acid is different there's 20 of them and they are dependent on those r groups that are shown here in blue they have different properties hydrophobic hydrophilic etc cysteine is a very special amino acid because it can form a disulfide bond with another cysteine. So proteins fold in a variety, um, so let me rephrase. So this is something that's very confusing to students and we have an in-person lab, Ugh, don't think you guys are gonna get to do it, um, that really helps students. So I'm gonna try to go over this and we'll go over this again and again until students understand it in class. But they have, a different, they have four levels of kind of structure or four levels of folding. We have what is called the primary structure, and here's my abbreviation for primary. It's a primary structure, and that is just the sequence of amino acids, right? So which of the 20 are held together in which um, order, right? So when I think of a primary structure, it's really just amino acid one, amino acid two, amino acid three, amino acid four, et cetera, right? That is the primary sequence. The secondary sequence or the secondary structure of proteins are maintained by hydrogen bonds. And these specifically occur, hydrogen, bo hydrogen bonds between the, um, between the peptide or the protein backbone. And what is the backbone of a protein? Those are those C, N, um, C, C, whatever um, bonds. So if I go back here, this here is going to be the backbone. It's not the R groups, it's the backbone, all right? And they come in two different flavors. One is an alpha helix, which forms a little helix. And one is a pleated sheet. It kind of goes like this. And I'll show you pictures of this, where we have hydrogen bonding kind of between them holding those structures together. So that's H bonds, hydrogen bonds. Then we have what is called the tertiary structure. And the tertiary structure um, is really the three-dimensional shape. It's when you get single sequences and then you might have an alpha helix and then you might have some data sheets and then you might just might have more structure that kind of folds back on itself to be another alpha helix and another dated sheet. But this is the three-dimensional sh shape of a structure, um, of a protein. And this results not from the backbone, but from interactions of the R group. And you can have hydrogen bonding, you can have ionic bonding, meaning positive and negative amino acids coming together. You can also have hydrophobic interactions where all the hydrophobic amino acids want to interact with each other to get away from that watery environment. All right. And then we have a fourth one, which is called quaternary, quaternary, where, and that, what that means is that you have two tertiaries coming together, two ter tertiary together. And I'll show you pictures of that in just a second. All right, so again, one, primary structure, that is just the sequence of amino acids, the sequence of the amino acid chain, 
right? So here's our primary structure. We have, these are the variety of amino acids, um, leucine, valine, lysine, lysine, glycine, histidine, whatever. Not gonna make you memorize those. The secondary structure are maintained by hydrogen bonds between the backbone. So again, this is an alpha helix, but they can also be in the, they can also be beta sheet, which is not shown here. So if we look at the hydrogen bonding, this is occurring on the backbone, between the backbone of these proteins, right? So if we look at, sorry, backtrack. So primary bonds, sorry, primary structure are held together by peptide bonds. Secondary structure are held together by H bonds. The third, the tertiary structure is held together by the R groups, right? And these can be a variety. This can be H bonds. It can be hydrophobic interactions. It can be ionic can even be those disulfide bonds. Then we have this last and final one, which is the quaternary structure, where you have full 3D proteins coming together to form one big old protein, right? So quaternary, multiple three-dimensional proteins coming together. So protein function depends entirely on their 3D shape or their 3D structure, right? The precise positioning of those R groups le um, leads to, eh? the precise, the precise fun um, positioning of those R groups leads directly to their either secondary or tertiary um, structures, right? So the sequence will dictate what kind of folds they have, um, which will then lead to what function they have, all right? So if we look here, so here's an example of, um, of a beta pleated sheet. So that's the secondary structure. Notice we have hydrogen bonding of the backbones. Our groups are not involved here. Um, however, those when they come together will form a three-dimensional tertiary structure. So here's our three-dimensional shape. And then if we have multiple three-dimensional shapes coming together, that would be quaternary, all right? Um, forming, for example, in this example, um, a strand of silk. Um, however, again, if you have a 3D protein, right? So this would be its tertiary structure. Um, it can break down or become denatured. And if it comes denatured, it goes down back to its primary or just sequence of amino acids. It loses its full three-dimensional shape, right? That's denaturation. And if you have a denatured protein, you, have, you lose your function, no function. All right, and that's it for proteins.